This one's a little different. Pentecostal failure, the reason I called it the Pentecostal failure is because I grew up, I grew up Pentecostal and uh, how many people grew up in a Pentecostal church? See, not very many. Most of you grew up uh, raised by wild wolves, but uh, <laughs> I was raised by spiritual ones. Um, but it's interesting because I remember being a young child and growing up in a Pentecostal church, and we, we had those times when the Spirit moved and it got a little weird and we saw weird stuff, but that was never the emphasis of the messages. That was never really the main emphasis of what was going on. So, number one, the emphasis of the Pentecostal church used to be holiness and not gifts. A lot of times when I would come into a service as a young man, I remember hearing holiness probably more than any other, any other subject, any other topic, any other thing that anybody ever preached about. I heard holiness, holiness, holiness. And it came with a lot of pulpit pounding, and it came with a lot of, uh, uh, it came with a lot of great illustrations. And, uh, and usually we would be urged to come down to an altar and pray afterwards or spend some time alone with God. And, and sometimes the manifestations would come after that would happen. And so the emphasis of the Pentecostal church was holiness. Now, now what is holiness? Well, holiness simply is, is from the Hebrew Kodesh, which means set apart or different. It means something that's, that's holy. It means you're the good china. <laughs> you, ever, you ever have the good china? <clears throat> when, when we got married, Nicole's grandmother gave us some nice brand new set of good china. And to this day, we've never used it. That's how holy it is to us. <laughs> That's how much she never wants to wash it. Um, but it's, it's just one of those things. It's set apart. It's for a special occasion. And, uh, you know, if, if, if somebody called and said that some, some very important person was coming or some dignitary was coming to visit us, we might whip out that china because it's, it's set apart. Well, God has, has set us apart to be special for Him, to be, to be unique to Him. And, and that's, that's what holiness is, basically. It's being set apart to God. And, and one, of the, one of the things that I think has, has hurt us in the Pentecostal church and in the charismatic church is the fact that we, we got off track, and I'm going to go more through the history when I get to point number two, we kind of got off track on it, what exactly holiness is. Instead of making it being separated onto God, we made it a bunch of other stuff that, that really has nothing to do with holiness. And because of that, I think people got confused. And people got messed up. And so today, the focus, a lot of times, the focus isn't so much on holiness in various charismatic and Pentecostal churches. And sometimes it's not even so much on the gifts. But some places you go, you do have that focus on the gifts. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and we, we always had, you know, in every Pentecostal church, you've got that, that one person who usually gives a message in tongues, and they usually only get inspired to do that when there's new visitors, you know. That's when they, that's when they get the inspiration. I remember one time, it was a Sunday night, and my friend was, was staying at my place, and, and we were both in high school, and and I said, hey, you want to come to church with me tonight? He said, oh, yeah, I got nothing better to do in my well. So he came to church. I was like, Lord, please help Sister Phyllis to keep her mouth shut this week. <laughs> she was the one. She's the one to always have. And he's sitting next to me. And sure enough, sure enough, we had a time of prayer. All of a sudden, there was quiet. And I'm sweating. I'm going, okay, that's been five seconds of quiet. This isn't good. And all of a sudden, here she comes, popping up, screaming out. And my friend, I thought he'd be terrified. He started giggling. <laughs> he thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard in his life. And he's like, is that lady speaking Spanish or what? <laughs> I was like, no, she's speaking in tongues. He's like, well, what's going to happen next? I said, somebody's got to give the interpretation. And then, <laughs> and then he's like, the whole time he's like, that was the interpreter. I said, yeah. How do you know he's right? <laughs> we just kind of got to hope he is. <laughs> just kinda, you know. 
But it was it was weird growing up Pentecostal because a lot of kids didn't have the things we had. And and and, uh, and so my best friend in high school turned out to be a, a kid that went to the Christian Fundamentalist Church. And uh, the, the Christian Fundamentalist Church was kind of like it was kind of like a, a just a, a pretty pretty traditional Orthodox church. Uh, but they didn't believe in the manifestations or the gifts of the Spirit in operation today. And they were very... Uh, I went to a couple of revivals of history. They were very hellfire and brimstone. If you've ever been to like, you better confess your sins or you're going to... You know, it was one of those like, oh man, he heard it. I know, I'm, I'm coming forward because that guy's going to kill me if I don't. So it wasn't, it wasn't really... It was just one of those scary churches. And my friend went to that church and... And, and, and I went to the assemblies, and we made ourselves a deal one year. I, he would come to my youth convention, and then I'd go to his youth retreat. And my youth convention was the week before his youth retreat. And he came to my youth convention, and he was freaked out. Because he, he first of all, he dressed really nice the first night. And, and he didn't realize that most of the got youth conventions. It's like jeans and t-shirts. Nobody dresses nice. So he kind of, you know... Stuck out with his little baby blue tuxedo. But um, <laughs> he didn't wear one of those. But he was dressed a little too nice. And and, uh, and we tried to get him dressed down. But he's like, you need to respect the house of God. And I was like, this is amazing. Anyway, we, we, we got in there. And uh, people started singing. And people were like raising their hands. And we were all standing up. And, and I turned around and looked at him. And he was like. And I think he was like, Lord Jesus, please protect me from these crazy people. <laughs> God, I am so sorry I injured this cultish building. Please keep me protected while I'm here. Hope they're cult cooties not to rub off on me. Right? Oh, please, Jesus. So the next week, I said, oh, I'm going to your retreat now. And we made that deal. So so I went to his retreat. We started singing a song I really liked. was, I'll obey and serve you. I'll obey and show I trust you. And so as we sang that song, I just, oh, I sensed the spirit. I got up. I was like, I'll obey, my life is in you. Pretty soon, I was the only voice I heard singing. <laughs> so I turn around, I'm kind of sitting in the front row, turn around and look at everybody, and they're all like, <laughs> what's wrong with him? <laughs> so I realized, I was like, I was like, you know, my friend's like, sit down. <laughs> so I sit down. I was like, what do you guys do when you get blessed here? It's like we close our eyes. Like, How can you tell if you're asleep or blessed? Like, we don't know. We just hope. But but the thing is that there's there's such a vast difference, and and one of the problems that that, that we have sometimes is that we spend a lot of our focus on the gifts, and when we make the gifts our focus, sometimes we lose out on the message. When I was at that retreat, later on, after I'd been there for a couple days, uh, there was this guy who was in the serving line, and he's putting mashed potatoes on my tray, and he looked at me and said, you're that assembly's boy, aren't you? you know? Yes, I am, Cletus. You're sharpening your knife, going to come hunt me? I said, yes, I'm the assembly's boy. He said, well, I know you people. I used to have a friend that was assemblies. He was... He was awful. He said, I went, to the, I went to the other church in town, and I thank God for it, because my folks, they made us live right. But my friend, he used to go party all the time. He did whatever he wanted, slept with whoever he wanted, and then he'd go to the Assemblies Church on the weekend and feel Jesus and get goosebumps. He thought that made it okay. And I said, well, that's not what we believe. Because that's what a lot of people do. But I said, that's not what we believe. He said, well, I've seen some other people act just the same way. And he was pretty bitter towards Pentecostals because of a few experiences he had with some of his friends who were Pentecostal. And he watched their lifestyle, and he didn't see any holiness. All he really saw was the fact that they'd get goosebumps and feel good about themselves, and they go back into the sinful world. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 17 says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, Make straight paths for your feet. So that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, 
lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. And by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Our emphasis in the church, and whether it's a Pentecostal church or a, a fundamentalist church or a Baptist church, Lutheran church, Catholic church, whatever church, the emphasis should be a relationship with God. It should be a holiness, a longing to be like God, a longing to be with God, a longing to desire God. Yet so often it becomes these other little fringe focuses. It becomes these other little things. Sometimes we major in our distinctions and because of it we lose our major focus. So number two, we lost our way when holiness became entangled with self-righteousness. We lost our way when holiness became entangled with self-righteousness. The Pentecostal the, the Pentecostal movement began at the turn of the century and, and there was an awesome move of God taking place in a lot of rural areas, in a lot of crusades, in a lot of tent meetings. And, and when, when, the, when the Holy Spirit really broke out, it happened at Azusa Street. And in the 30s, God began to move in such a mighty way. And one of the amazing things was when God got involved, something amazing happened. Because if you would have walked into that, that small place in Azusa Street, that building, you would have seen, you would have seen African Americans, and you would have seen white people, and Oriental people, and you would have seen Korean people, and you would have seen all these different nationalities coming together, experiencing God as one. But as soon as men got involved in that, as soon as we decided to form something official, well, okay, let's see. We're going to, oh, the white people come on over here, you can be the assemblies, and you African Americans can be the apostolics, and uh, you white people who like this better than this can be the church of God, and you got, and we all divided again. And then it became all this, this kind of division that happened, and the last Probably the last 20 years, one of the things the Assemblies of God has done, especially under our, our former superintendent, Tom Trask, we've been working towards reconciliation from some of the division that happened after Azusa Street, because I don't think God ever wanted us to be divided. He wanted us to be united. But it, through our history, division has been a huge thing in Pentecost, because whenever the Holy Spirit comes into the picture, the Holy Spirit is a uniter. You realize what happened in Acts chapter 2 is just the opposite of what happened in Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, men were saying, let's build a monument for ourselves. Let's go out and let's build this big tower that reaches into the heavens, and we can study the stars. And, we can... and God said, no, I'm not going to let that happen. And what did he do? He confused the language. And he confused us so much that nobody knew what was going on, and they all went their separate ways. What happened in Acts chapter 2? They all came under submission in one accord to God and said, let's seek God. And all of a sudden, he gave them the gift of different languages that the people out in the street began to hear praising to God in their own language, which basically all these different language groups were hearing what? The same thing. Coming under that banner. Basically saying, if we try to do something for self, guess what we're going to do? We're going to unravel it. We're going to frustrate and confuse our lives. If we try to do something under the will of God, we're going to be blessed and the Holy Spirit is a unifier. And that's one thing we always have to remember. The Holy Spirit unifies. A lot of things that are called revivals today and a lot of things that are, that are going on today, you're not seeing much unity come out of it. As a matter of fact, you're seeing new churches spring up all the time because of disunity. The Holy Spirit will unify when the Holy Spirit's at work. And one of the problems is we lose our way sometimes through holiness and we become entangled with self-righteousness. And that's the trap of, of being a Pentecostal, being charismatic, 
One of the traps is believing that, hey, I had an emotional experience. That was awesome. Or God gave me a special gift. That was super. But guess what? God gives you those gifts to be a servant. If God gives you a gift, it doesn't mean you're better than somebody else. And that, that, that thought, that kind of gifting leads to self-righteousness. And one of the downfalls of the church is this man who gave me my mashed potatoes at that retreat. He had been a victim of somebody's self-righteousness. Somebody who had an experience and felt superior. Somebody who, who maybe had an emotion and felt superior, but wasn't living or walking out that thing in their lives. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. <coughs> we have to be careful with where we go when God begins to move in us. Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 through 23 says, Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility, the worship of angels, Intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch. Do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and the neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Before we get too much into this, let me explain to you human nature. Human nature swings pendulums. And we go back and forth, and we go back and forth. And we go, hey, you know what? We want George Bush. <laughs> we don't want him. We want Barack Obama. <laughs> we don't want him no more. Let's put Republicans in the Congress. <laughs> we keep thinking that an extreme change is always going to bring the right thing about. I had, I had a friend who, he was a deacon at a Pentecostal church in Alaska, and they had a pastor who was very... Praise God. It's good to be here this morning. Turn in your books to page. He just kind of monotone and real dead. And they had him for several years. And the church voted him out. They're like, get out of here, man. You're boring. And they found somebody who was... Whoa! You know, just kind of firebrand. And they were like, we like this guy. They liked him for about a year. And then they realized, he's nuts. So what they did was when his three years came up, they voted him out. And they said, we need, we need a guy who's a little more, a little more balanced and dignified. And they found a guy who was more like that, and they voted him in, and they were like, oh, this is so boring again. Here we go. And they could never find this, this happy medium. We, we get that way sometimes. We go to extremes to try to change things. And sometimes God really doesn't want us going to those extremes. Sometimes the reason we're never happy is because we're always chasing the extreme end of something and never finding the contentment of just being with God. Just being with God. And if you had a relationship with, uh, with your spouse and you were like, hey, you know, what if I said to Nicole, hey, Nicole, guess what? We're going to go out, we're going to have fun, and we're going to have so much fun. We're going to go, we're going to go to Gillette, we're going to go to a restaurant, and then we're going to go to, we're going to go to a movie, we're going to have a lot of fun, we're going to do all this, we're going to, and, and we go, and we go, and we do it, and we have fun, and then come back, oh, that was really cool, that was really cool. Hey, we should do that sometime again, and I'll talk to you later. <coughs> and then a few days later, I walk up to her, hey, Nicole, guess what we're going to do today? We're going to do it. Well, if the only time I ever communicated with her was when we went and did something, there'd be something lacking in our relationship. It would be an event-based relationship. The important times in a relationship are those quiet communication times. It's those times when you can do nothing and just enjoy one another. It's those times when there doesn't have to be something radical to fulfill 
your excitement and entertainment meter. And there could just be that small, quiet, how you doing today, hon? That's what a real relationship is. And we tend to swing the pendulum. One of the ways that we swing the pendulum is a self-righteous issue. It says here, basically the gist of the scripture is, you cannot overcome flesh with flesh. You want to overcome your flesh? You can't do it with flesh. You can't overcome flesh with flesh. You can't say, okay, I have a real problem with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the fact that uh, I, 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 I carry magnets everywhere I go and I, I, have a, I have a strong will to bang them together whenever I'm around them. So I, I put them in my pocket, I try to, but I, I just grab them and I keep banging them around. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie all my fingers together with, with little, little ties from a glad bag. And so that I can go around. You'll look like an idiot. And the other thing you'll do is you're going to be bound now. See, what we try to do is we try to, we try to fix one area of bondage in our life by putting another area of our life into bondage. And pretty soon, we've got ourselves so fenced in, we really can't go anywhere. And people are like, hey, I'm lost. Can you reach me? Uh, I really don't want to go where you're at. <laughs> There's a lot of things that could really trip me up along the way. We get bound. We become don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. Well, after this big move of God in the 30s that really, really cemented the mainstream of Pentecost, the things kind of died down a little bit in the 40s. And then in the 50s, God began to move in a mighty way. And there was great tent revivals. And people like Jack Coe and Oral Roberts were, were, were having amazing healing crusades across the land. And, and people were getting kind of revived. And something sprung up from that called the Holiness Movement. And the Holiness Movement began as a good thing. It was people desiring to seek God with all they had. People who wanted to set themselves apart to God, right? That's what I want to do. Well, then, something happened with the holiness movement. People begin to say, you know, if we're really holy, we're not just going to pray and read the Bible. We're not going to play cards. Because if there's any evil in this world, it's all found in a little deck of cards. The worst possible evil in the world. And we're not going to play pool. Because we know that will send you straight to hell, fool. And we're not going to dance. We shouldn't dance. And we're not going to. We're not going to do this. And, we're not. and all of a sudden, everybody kept saying, "Oh, do you know what else we shouldn't do? We shouldn't tweeze our eyebrows. <laughs> because if you're really a Christian, you've got a full brow, not a tweeze. Okay, put that on the list. What about pants? Women shouldn't wear pants." No, no, no. Men wear the pants, right? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Women should always wear skirts, yeah. but they can't be above their knees. That's right. No, no above the knees. And, and women should not wear makeup. Because no, Scratch that one. No, no. Okay, let's put it on there. Women should not wear makeup, and they shouldn't adorn themselves with jewelry. They shouldn't have... Pretty soon we got all these different things. And, and most of them, most of them, 99.9% .9 of them, had no scriptural authority. They were just the things of man. And they were the things of people tripping each other out, trying to control one another, and trying to control flesh with flesh. Man, if I don't do these things, if I keep myself from doing these things, then I can... And what happened was, a generation, and a lot of you guys are this generation, a lot of you guys are boomers. How many of you are boomers? Everybody say, boom. boom. <laughs> that wasn't a very big boom. I'm looking for supersonic. <laughs> but you guys are boomers, and, and a lot of you grew up with, with maybe parents. If you, if you grew up in the church, you were, like, you were like, hey, this guy, you know what? He doesn't smoke or chew or dance or, or cuss. And he's the biggest jerk I've ever met in my life. <laughs> because what they were doing was they were applying all this outward holiness, and they were forgetting about the holiness God. And the holiness God wants is he wants you to forgive. He wants you to forgive when you feel like someone's transgressed you. 
and you can't forgive them. He wants you to go ahead and do it because he did it for you on the cross. He wants you to love whether or not anybody chooses to love you back. He wants you to give even when nobody else is paying attention or gives back to you. He wants you to serve where everybody else wants to be served. This is holiness. This is what God wants from us. He wants us to have his heart. And his heart isn't bound up in some of the legalistic things that some of those people who call themselves holy are bound up in. Because if his heart was bound up in those things, he would have never met me. And he would have never met you. Because he would have never reached beyond the stains that were on us. True holiness isn't self-imposed religion and false humility. It's not the neglect of the body. They're of no value against the fight against the flesh. If you want to be holy, don't submit your body to torture. Submit your spirit to God. And let him use you. Let him lead you. Instead of drawing a diagram of where you can and cannot go as a Christian, let the Holy Spirit lead you step by step. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That lamp unto thy feet, that only takes you one step at a time. Because God wants you to trust him. So one of the problems that happened was the holiness movement had a generation watching it and they saw people that didn't do this and didn't do that and didn't do this. But that generation saw the hypocrisy behind it because there was a lot of hatred and bitterness, a lot of competition in the church, a lot of, I can do anything better than you. Can I can do anything better than you? That stinks. When that begins to happen, we don't accomplish anything. The unity that the Holy Spirit had woven was becoming undone by the flesh. So number three. We need to couple an operation of the gifts with an understanding of grace. We need to couple an operation of the gifts with an understanding of grace. What is grace? Everybody can, pretty much everybody can define grace. It's pretty much unmerited favor. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that'll pardon and claims with thee. Grace that is greater than all your sins except going to the movies, drinking, dancing, smoking, cussing, looking cross-eyed at people, smelling bad. All my sin. If you grew up Pentecostal, you probably grew up in a church where people were seeking the Holy Spirit. And they come down to an altar and they'd pray. And nothing would happen. And they might go crying to a pastor or to somebody. And that person would say to them, Well, maybe there's just some sin in you that you need to... Really? Because here's the problem, pastor. There's sin in you that you need to deal with and you got it. See, we don't understand grace when we start doing that. We don't understand grace when we start saying... Well, you know what? You're not qualified to do this because you've had this experience or you've had that experience. We don't understand grace when we say, well, you know, you can't do this because you're, you're, you're over here and, and God really wants you to be over here. Do you understand? And I hate it when the spiritual excuses come out. If you want to stop somebody from doing something, give them a, a physical excuse. You, know, you can tell somebody, hey, I don't want you doing this because you're a moron. 
Exactly. <laughs> but don't throw, don't throw God in that mix. Because what happens is people get spiritually wounded. People get spiritually wounded because they start thinking, I'm not good enough for God. There's a generation that gets that gets turned away because they get turned off because they're told, hey, you're not good enough. No matter what you do, you're not good enough. You will never, ever be good enough. And yet at the same time, that generation that's saying that to a younger generation, the younger generation is seeing the sins <coughs> that that older generation has. I say, well, what about things like love and forgiveness? What about compassion? What about mercy? We need to have an understanding of grace. We need to walk in holiness. But we need to also walk in grace. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's your job as a Christian. Your job as a Christian is not to get somebody into a new level. That's your job as an Amway salesman. Your job as a Christian isn't to push your sibling into a new dimension. Your job isn't to trip them out with fantastic new information. <coughs> your job is to lift up Christ. Just lift up Christ. Just love Him. Show people that you are content with Jesus Christ. <coughs> and the Holy Spirit will do all the rest of the work. <coughs> Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. Draw men unto me. That's all you got to do is lift up Jesus. You know why our lives get so complicated sometimes? Because we create schedules that God didn't create. We make, we make 14 different points of Christianity, and God says there's one point. Lift me up. Get close to me. Follow me. Know me. Press into me. <clears throat> Be content with me. Learn to love me. And if people see you, and if people see the joy that you've got because you're following me, you won't have to bust their days up. You won't have to go, can I tell you something? They'll walk up to you and go, hey, I got a question for you. Why didn't you just punch that guy's lights out? And then you can say, well, let me tell you why I didn't punch that guy's lights out. Because I'm a Christian, and I know you're not. And I'm hoping you'll do it for me. No. <laughs> Give me 20 bucks. 20 pre-blessed bucks, too. You don't have to buy them. Um, all you have to do, all you have to do is just lift up Jesus and people will walk up to you and they'll begin to ask you questions. They'll begin to say, what, why, why did you do that? I don't get that. When you start making selfless choices, people are going to go, oh, that don't make sense. Because the world's, the world's living for themselves. Just the other day, someone was at a training session and uh, they, were, they were asked, uh, it was on, on TV, they were training these people to do CPR. And the teacher was saying, okay, now, let's say this guy's at the pool and he's dying and you need to go resuscitate him. And the lady that was at the CPR class said, well, who is the guy? <laughs> the teacher said, it doesn't matter, Go. I said, well, I need to know if I like him or not. Because if i got a problem with him, I ain't going to do it. That's the world's attitude. The world's out there for themselves. We start making selfless choices by lifting up Christ. They're going to say, why did you do that? And they might even come at you like, are you stupid? And then when they ask you that, just go, yeah, you know why? <laughs> but share. But God will open doors supernaturally if you'll just lift him up. So the Pentecostal failure has basically been self-righteousness. We haven't put enough emphasis on the cross 
And we've put so much emphasis on holiness that we think that it's a system, and it's not. My holiness is Christ and Him crucified. Because anything I add to that is filthy rags, and it does nothing for me. When I stand before God, I'm going to have to answer for the things I've done. And the only thing that can cover the things I've done is the blood of Christ. So we all need to stand on the cross. Let's bow our heads. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I'm going to ask a simple question. Have you given your life to Christ? Have you surrendered it to Him? Maybe you've been turned off in the past by Christianity, or maybe somebody's hurt you, or maybe you've walked away from what you know is true. And you know the Father's calling you home today. He's a good God. He loves you. Don't hide in the bushes. Don't run from His presence. Run to His presence through the cross. If you're here today and you say, you know what? I need to have more of God in my life. I... I need to change my ways. I need to come home. If you've been lost and you just need to come home this morning, with everybody's head down, nobody's looking around, I'm not going to embarrass anybody this morning. I'd just like to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all say this prayer together. Father God, I thank you. <coughs> Thank you for creating me, for giving me life, and giving me hope. I thank you for the forgiveness of my sins through your cross. May I walk with you. May I live with you. And may I lift you up all the days of my life. Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. <clears throat> Shake a few hands. This might be the last day to swim in Keyhole. So. <laughs>